Well, a very big welcome to you all. Welcome to International Coach Week. My name is Natalie Ashdown from Open Door Coaching, and it's a pleasure to be presenting uh, this interview today for you uh, in conjunction with our partner, Synergy Global. And today, it's a real privilege to to be uh, presenting this interview, as I mentioned, on leading volunteers through the global pandemic. And we're going to re be re um, understanding some lessons in leadership and change uh, with Life Saving Victoria. And it's a privilege to welcome to the line Emma Atkins, General Manager of People. Welcome, Emma, and thank you so much for joining us um, today. Thanks, Sally. Lovely to be here. So just before we begin, uh, in terms of acknowledgement to country, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians on the lands on which we meet today and their con continuing connection to the land, waters and communities of Australia. And we pay our respects to them and to elders past, present and emerging. So I can stop um, sharing my screen now and we can uh, just uh, engage in our conversation. And as I mentioned, we're um, joining on the line with Emma Atkins from life-saving Victoria. She's the general manager of people and culture. Uh, she's a wonderful leader. I asked her to come and share with us the um, amazing lessons that she's learned and the way that she led um, life-saving Victoria with her leadership team through the global pandemic. Um, I've known Emma for a number of years now. It's been a privilege to, um, you know, to be working with you. Uh, I like, I've, um, uh, for those of you who don't know, that I actually run the Nippers program, which is for our junior people um, at a beach called Waratah Beach Surf Life Saving Club in Victoria. And uh, about 190 children um, join our program. And that's how I've met um, Emma through those programs. But I think um, what I especially um, have enjoyed in terms of our working together, Emma, is how you've been able to help people like myself through difficult leadership situations as well. Um, it's easy, actually, I think, to lead an organisation through the easy times. Um, everything's going well, it's all fine. But it, it, takes, um, it takes real leaders and it takes um, people like yourself to assist leaders um, during the difficult times. So um, that's been one of my privileges in, order, in, in terms of working with you. So thank you up front for that. <laughs> Um, thanks, Ali. You and so many of our volunteers do an absolutely phenomenal job teaching the next generation of lifesavers. So um, that's our job to, to be here and support that. So it's, um, it's, it's my pleasure. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. So um, Emma, um, LSV has got a team of 500 people and over 37,000 volunteers come together to run to run the programs, um, not only the NIPAS programs, but the entire life-saving um, program. So I wonder, could you just give us an, and we're talking about uh, lessons in leadership and leading through the global pandemic, but I'm wondering, could you just give us an overview of the impact that the COVID restrictions, particularly in Victoria, um, and the impact of lockdown, what, what impact that had on LSV um, and its volunteers? Thanks, Nat. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, um, you know, it, it put people at the centre of everything we do because this is a really people-centric problem um, being the pandemic. So, but for Life Saving Victoria, um, you know, from a staffing perspective, we, we do have... Uh, so 80 full-time staff and about that swells to about 500 over summer, um, along with our, you know, almost 38,000 volunteers. Um, but uh, with the lead up and, and a lot of what we do is um, our funding comes from, from two sources primarily, which is uh, government um, funded, but we've also got a, quite a large social enterprise. So that includes um, public training. So we, we teach first aid and, and various other things. Um, you know, we've got a function centre here that pays, you know, or contributes to the building and, and the running of Life Saving Victoria. Um, and then, a, you know, some retail and social enterprise in supporting our aquatic facilities. Um, so that came to a complete standstill. So um, like a lot of businesses around the world, um, we had a real revenue problem. Um, we didn't have money coming in. So that was a, a direct impact. And, and also looking at um, when we could start up and, and the, the flow on impact is not only money, monetary wise, but also um, we teach lifeguards how to be lifeguards. Um, so the flow on effect was there was a whole lot of people out there not being trained. Um, likewise, we work with our aquatic centre to centres to teach kids how to, how to swim. Um, so there was a whole lot of kids that weren't going to swim. Um, 
So there was a stand down of our all of our casual, casual staff and then a, a really big look at how we were going to survive and, and potentially what some downsizing would look like from a staffing perspective. All the while, we had a summer fast approaching and, um, and an off season that we had to prepare um, our volunteers to be able to be rescue ready for a season ahead. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, although we're in lockdown, the community still exists and, and people still were going swimming and, and certainly that was fast approaching towards summer. So um, there was a, a real impact on how we would even do life-saving. Um, would we be able to run nippers, um, which make up, so of our 38,000, our nippers make up 11, over 11,000, which is amazing. And then there's probably one or two parents per, per nipper. So if nippers doesn't run, there's a considerable impact on our clubs um, and their ability to find patrolling members. So it's a, it's a lot, it was wide ranging, like most organisations, but some really different um, challenges within each of those. Yeah, absolutely. And you were sharing with me actually um, that just, I mean, before lockdown, um, LSV had to work with people through the, the bushfires um, and some tragedies that had happened um, during the season. So um, if you wouldn't mind sharing with me a little bit about that, but also um, when COVID hit and the lockdowns um, started to, to kick in, um, and they started to become real. I wonder, do you remember what was going through your mind at the time? You'd just come off that massive bushfire season and, and then COVID hit. So would you mind sharing with us what yeah. was going on? Yeah. Yeah, and I've had, um, you know, as we all do, we've got time to reflect now. So, um, yeah, I was sharing with you, you know, reaching probably back to 2018, the season 2018-19, we had some considerable uh, staffing changes and, and volunteer changes, which meant we went into a season um, you know, with some real challenges operationally, um, we had a growing uh, number of um, what we call um, behavioural issues. So there was a real, um, I think, you know, a little bit of catching up in getting caught up in that cancel, um, you know, kind of uh, mentality that's going around now. And, and people were really, um, there was a whole lot of member to member issues that, that take a toll, you know, um, as you work through them and, and try to, to get everyone operating. And then we rolled into Easter and, and uh, of 2019 and, and probably one of the most significant days um, in my time at Life Saving Victoria um, and for Life Saving Victoria where we lost two of our uh, lifesavers in a, a really tragic incident um, down at Port Campbell where they went out to save somebody and they lost their lives. The, they paid the ultimate price for their bravery. And, um, and you know, that, that has ongoing um, you know, implications, but we, you know, we, we went down there and we based ourselves down there for, um, you know, a month, probably all up by the time we worked through um, support and funerals and, um, and a lot of other things. So it, it was a really um, hard time for the whole organisation and, and life-saving right around the country. Um, you know, came came through that, and you know, we, we still were providing a lot of support to them. Um, and then um, all of a sudden, we've got a new challenge, and that was uh, coming into a season of bushfires. And um, and it was it was something new. I mean, our our lifesavers and our lifeguards were in uh, on the beach in masks, which seemed unfathomable at the time. <laughs> How could they do their jobs in masks and was there going to be long-term impact um, on people's health and um, and we had to rewrite policy and how we do things and we were closing beaches when we had never closed beaches before and 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 it was quite exhausting to to be honest and we we kind of come off that um came out of that you know and, and obviously some of our um communities were really impacted and um, we were supporting you know malacuda significantly Lake Centrance um, and then some of the aquatic centres in, in all Boston regional Victoria. So, um, you know, coming off that and then all of a sudden we started to get wind of, of what was going to be um, the global pandemic. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, I remember coming, actually doing a trip to Waratah and, and, then, and then Lake Centrance and um, back to the MCG for the International Women's um, 
cup that was there, the World Cup, and 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 I think that's kind of when it hit. And um, you know, I, I do remember being in the boardroom at LSV, and we were with our leadership team, and and we, you know, I guess it was a moment we realised this was real, and it was going to have far-reaching implications. And in all honesty, at the time, I just. I was just exhausted and I just, uh, on a really personal level, I just didn't know I was up for it. I just thought, I don't know how I can, like it is, this is something, bushfires are one thing, but I mean, this is something so, so different and and the human impact. And, and I, you know, I think I come back to, it really put honed in on the people centric nature of our organisation and, and, the very personal impact um, this was going to have on both our staff, um, whether they could work or not, but but also our volunteers from a safety perspective, from a mental health perspective, um, and how could I possibly uh, help them navigate it when I had no clue what to do? Yeah, thank you for sharing, Emma. I, I, I really feel with what you're saying there and... Um, I think you're not alone. I, I appreciate your your vulnerability and your honesty to say, you know, as a leader, I think a lot of us questioned whether we were up for it um, and whether we had the strengths and the skills and the resilience needed. But, um, yeah, there's no doubt that, 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 you know, from what I witnessed, you were definitely, <laughs> you were definitely there for it. So, well, you know, you were, you, you brought all those skills and strengths um, and the people centred to the, um, to the exercises. So, yeah, I, I remember um, at the time you were very clear in your announcements when you went out uh, to the, the, the community. Um, you were very clear in your announcements from the beginning that we would be that, that we all should be, be focusing on respect and what we can do. And I loved that from a coaching point of view. It, it really it resonates with all of us on the line about, you know, we're focusing on what we can do, not what we can't do. So can you share with us how that focus um, really shaped your response as the situations kept changing in Victoria as well? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, look, I think LSV has really strong values and, um, you know, we have a set of them, we refer back to them um, all the time. But as a leadership group, we we got together and we said we're going to draft these guiding principles um, and, and, you know, they are going to be the core of everything we do. Um, and certainly from there, you know, we drafted some of our own in and around the nipper space because, you know, you're talking about kids and, and that response has to resonate with, with people looking after kids. So, um, but it did drive it. And look, at the end of the day, safety was our number one priority and it was safety of our, our people uh, and the community. So um, that drove, you know, all the responses um, we had and we said we're going to focus on as you said what we can do um, because there was you know I mean everybody was dealing with such negativity on every day um, mm. but we're talking about a community organization where one we've got an obligation to the community to do um, and and to um, to keep people safe um, but also you know it's such an important part of people's lives that if we could do one thing to keep life saving going and it, we had to, like everybody else, and I hate using the word now, but pivot, um, <laughs> you know, um, if we could help people connect through life saving, then geez, we're going to do our best to do it. So um, that, that really drove everything we did. And, um, you know, I, I, look, I went back and looked at our nippers or our, our junior um, guiding principles. And, and, and I think a couple of the other key things that we really, wanted to say is it's going to look different so it's not going to it's not going to be how it always is and and um you know as you know now there's a change manager you know um people in in centrically don't like change and in life saving they really don't like change um so we really set the tone early on that it's going to look different there's no two ways about that and um but it's going to be okay um and we've got to be in this together and they were really you know, I know there was a lot of hashtag in this together going around, mm. but it drove everything we did. So, um, you know, we, and I guess the, the final piece was we don't have all the answers and we were really mm. upfront about that. And, you know, we're really lucky. We've got an organisation where we have some real expertise in a whole lot of different uh, worlds in volunteering. Um, and, 
you know, I guess it was in some ways empowering um, for, for those people that wanted to have input and step up um, that we were really, we embraced that because um, we all had to be in it together and, and find the solution together. Yeah, and no, I definitely relate to what you're saying there about not having all the answers. And I think there's something really important from a leadership point of view to, to, to say uh, that we don't have the answers, but to allow that co-creation of the answers throughout the membership to actually happen. Um, and you were talking about how, you know, life-saving Victoria, for those people that don't know, is, is everything from the little ones, the under fives, through to the, you know, the, the, the much older population of generation who've been around life-saving for you know, 20, 30, 40 years. So um, putting people at the centre, Emma, was that, was that a way of connecting you know, the, the ends of the poles of, of the population we have in life-saving Victoria as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nothing happens in life-saving without our people because mm. at the end of the day, that, that's what we do. But no, a really good point. I, I mean, and you saw the effect it had on on different um generations and and different you know within that you know the we have this group of older um victorians and and obviously nationally as well um you know, we have a large population of of older adults um and life saving is their connection you know they have been in life saving you know 50 years and they go to the beach and that's that's what they do that's their social hub and um, you know, I saw the effect on our older um, lifesavers was, you know, was immense. And, you know, um, so absolutely, you know, using lifesaving to connect was really important to us, not only because we wanted the members back year on year, because that was important for the clubs, but because we saw it as an opportunity um, to help the community and help our people. Um, you know, I think, uh, as you know, Nat, we ran um, 13 weeks straight of three sessions a week of member PD um, and, you know, we had different themes and, um, you know, we did a mental health Monday because we just said, right, lunchtime on a Monday, we'll get people from, you know, all different backgrounds and aspects and, and um, you know, if somebody, if one person's online and that's okay if, um, you know, if 100 are on it, great. Um, and we ran that the whole time because, again, putting people at the middle of everything, we wanted that connection. Yeah, and you were also talking to me about um, a lot of the other initiatives that you did from a connection point of view. You rang some of those older uh older Victorians, older people part as part of life saving and you did care packages from staff. And can you share with us the other ways that you perhaps, uh, you know, created those connections because they were so important at the time? Um, yeah, look, you know, from an organisational perspective, we we try to lead with, so the aquatic industry um, is a big part of what we do. Um, so we went out with a PD series for, um, you know, swim teachers and lifeguards and centres because they're all out of work. Um, so we we thought it was a great way um, to connect and, and keep up with with that side of our organisation. And so we ran them every week. And, um, and again, uh, a whole lot of very PD and, and key, um, key people to speak to. Um, we did the member side. Um, we took the opportunity to speak to, uh, to um, you know, lifeguards from the UK and lifeguards from the US. And, um, you know, we brought in the international side of things as well, because I think we all agree it was a great opportunity to to do things a little bit differently um, because people had time on their hands all of a sudden so you could make yeah. the most of that um, you know we did do care packages for all of our staff um, you know we we did it we made a commitment that we would we would communicate regularly with all parts of the business so um, you know I, I think I was saying to you you know we did for from a staffing perspective we had lunchtime sessions you know from fun sessions of trivia to to getting uh, some of our newer people and older people to present on a part of their life they wanted to present on. So it could be anything from COVID puppies that they, they'd they um, bought to their next travel plans that might be in 2025 um, yeah. and, and everything in between. Um, we had trivia, trivia nights. Um, 
And we did a junior symposium online um, where we brought all our junior members together and talked about did some mental health and, um, you know, some trivia and quizzes, um, you know, through to coffees, coffees with the oldies. So um, a group of the leadership team just took some time out and picked five members each and over a couple of weeks we had we had coffee with them online. Um, so the, there was varied and many. Um, we took nippers online and we did nippers at home and swimming lessons at home. So, um, you know, I, I guess it was just that human connection that, that really were those key initiatives that we took. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I particularly benefited from a lot of them. I made Mondays, my mental health Mondays, I just started setting aside that time. And it was terrific. I think the other thing I loved was the connections across all the different emergency services as well. Yeah. So I wonder actually whether emergency services ever had to be so connected from from that perspective, you know, to, to, to draw services and to uh, sure, they're connected when they're out on emergency, but but to, to actually create that connection across the community, I think was amazing as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think there's a lot of good that has come out of um, mm. the pandemic and, and the having to do things a bit differently. And, and I think, um, you know, we feel closer to the clubs, our life-saving clubs. So we have 57 life-saving saving clubs across the state. Um, they're all their own entities um, affiliated to Life Saving Victoria, but um, we've never felt more connected. And, and you know, again, um, going back to the start, one of the key things we identified was the information that um, the clubs get must come from us. Um, mm. We must speak regularly um, and often um, so that there's no hearsay, there's no oh, I wonder what they're thinking, I wonder what they're doing next. So we, you know, we appointed, um, we asked clubs to appoint COVID safe coordinators. Um, we trained them. So we did online training um, over a four week period. We had 250 COVID coordinators uh, sign up to that. Wow. Um, and then we proceeded to meet on a weekly basis. So we met with club presidents um, who sit at, obviously at the top of the information and we met with COVID coordinators and we alternated that. But we, we did that on a weekly basis and we, we made a decision, even if there was one or two updates, that's okay. Um, because one information was changing so quickly um, that we had to contextualise that for life saving. Um, and secondly, you know, just to have that connection and to hear from us. Um, we also made a decision that we would have the same people present every week. Um, so that mm. um, there was a sense that we've got this, um, that the leaders of the organisation, we're going to take the time to, to meet with everybody. Um, so, yeah, that kicked off a, you know, a, a series of communications along with we had, um, you know, we have circulars or, or information that goes out every week and every week there was a... Um, a health alert with the key information in there, highlighting the updates. There was an activity guide, so what you could and couldn't do, um, you know, and that really set off, you know, the path of making sure that the information was clear and right and, and that people thought, uh, knew that they were getting the right information and they could ask questions and they, geez, did they ask questions. So it was, <laughs> it was always highly entertaining to, to see what would come through. Yeah, I can imagine. I know some of those questions that I asked, like, um, how are we supposed to, like, uh, you know, sanitise the surfboards after every, uh, even, uh, you know, trivial kind of things like that? But, uh, yeah, I can definitely, yeah, definitely relate. I, I, you were instrumental uh, in, uh, in producing um, and, you know, drafting the organisation's plan response. You were talking about those documents and, um, and I remember myself reading them and just being in awe of the detail. Uh, the number of scenarios, the, the number of different services. Um, so I could scroll down to the bottom just to the nippers, but all of these other services that you were looking after, planning scenarios for in an unbelievably changing set of circumstances. Um, I was blown away just looking at the documents, but I'm wondering, um, so it's hard to imagine the scale that, that you were that you were um, you were trying to pull off, but but how did you how did you manage the enormity of the project um, when things were con um, continuously changing as well? Well, number one, we put a really good team together. So yeah, um, yeah. You know, that I, I think that was 
the criticality. The critical thing from day one is that you know we we got a pat we we formalised a pandemic team and um and we met regularly on that. Um, look, it was tough and and we made mistakes and um you know in we took longer than we had wanted to get information out at times. Um, Early on, we, we brought a specialist in to develop a, a pandemic framework, um, which I think I think was really important. So we knew what stage we were at and when we would lock down and that would go to the board to make make those decisions when we'd go up and down. And, and that drove, you know, that was based on um, health information. And um, so we were all really clear on, on what that meant. It was, it was as we moved into recovery and drafting those scenarios, um, as we talked about, that it got complicated. Um, you know, we ended up with four scenarios, so A, B, C and D, um, <laughs> yeah. um, D being full lockdown and what we could do and, and A, you know, A obviously being our new COVID normal um, or our new normal. Um, and then the ability for one area within the state, if it went into lockdown or it was a hotspot, could move into a different scenario. So, um you know, the, the approach was it was going to be different for each part of the business or pe- each part of life saving. Um, so, you know, it took us a while to get to that, that recovery framework. Um, we looked at a lot of documents. Um, we took a lot of information from a lot of uh, different organisations and, you know, some were flying. And um, But we, I think, we stopped and paused. And, you know, in life saving, um, it's... It's the backbone of everything we do. We pause and plan, and um, you know our lifesavers on the beach. You know we we tell them to always pause and plan, and, and you know that's certainly what we did. So we took our time and and really looked at what we needed, what we needed, and what we knew we needed was to tell the lifesaving clubs really simply how to do it, and that was the feedback we were getting. That was you guys were saying, just tell us how to do it, and we'll do it, um, mm. which which is not always the way in lifesaving, but. Um, <laughs> You know the enormity of the pandemic, and the um, I think um, the enormity of of a volunteer organisation asking its members, and ultimately we had to patrol those beaches. We had to get back up and running, and and you know to have responsibility of that, um, it was really important that that we drove that. Um, and and kind of articulated and contextualised it. So um, we made a decision that we were going to make everything from the high-level plan in those four scenarios and then um, translate them into checklists and information so that it was easy. That, you know, we just wanted, if we made it easy, it was easy then to comply, it was easy to to do what you needed to do, which was get people back. Mm, yeah, it, it just it occurred to me that actually the shutting down is actually not the hard thing. Like, it's hard, it's emotionally hard, but it's basically right where closing the beach or we're closing this or you can't do this now so it that that's kind of it, it's an emotional decision but that closing is actually easy to do or you just don't start up the, the um mm. you just don't start the services so um any of the services are just not happening yet but um it, it just occurred to me it's the coming back and those all those scenarios that you were actually um planning for um how do we do a safe return to mm. to service across all the different services yeah yeah, and and I'm interested also of what you, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing that that range of human behaviour you saw. So, I was one of those people. Just you, just tell me, Emma, what the rules are, and I will follow the rules. If LSV says we can, perfect. If LSV says we can't, fine. So, I mean, I'm on that side of the of the equation where I'm, you know, of, of the continuum where I'm following the rules. But I, I imagine you must have seen a, a massive range of behaviour in that regards as well. Yeah, we really did. Um, you know, and, and there were certainly many people that were, were um, like you, Nat, that said, just tell us and we'll do it and, and provide your feedback and um, you know, we're in this together. Um, but, you know, I, so so in that respect, I think we saw the very best in people. Um, so there was a real um, let's get in there and get this done, let's use can-do attitude. <laughs> we did see, you know, a lot of different behaviour surface. So there was the... Um, but what if we could, what if, what if, where's that loophole I can find that, you know, potentially I can take a group of people out, you know, um, 
paddling when we're in the middle of lockdown and um you know and, <laughs> and you know yeah. there was you know that's when we said just because you can doesn't mean you should um mm. and you know we there was a lot of those people looking for those loopholes that just you know wanted to push those boundaries um i think you know during when lockdown when we had permits we issued something like 1300 permits um which we issued from last time in victoria so there's a the real um you know, trying to get people to be able to do things without pushing boundaries too much. So there's that behaviour, which just, you had to check people, you know, you had to say, come on, um, we're in, remember what we're in. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then there was another, you know, another group of behaviours and I'll call them our naysayers. Um, mm -hmm. and they're the ones that, you know, life saving Victoria doesn't do anything right and um, look what they've done now and, um, you know, that was challenging and, you know, you're exhausted because you're doing these telecom, these video conferences every night and you're getting the same question week in, week out that you've answered back here. Um, but, you know, you keep smiling and, and it was, you know, it was fascinating. I get these text messages going, you have the patience of a saint and that will <laughs> kind of keep you going. But at the end of the day, sometimes the naysayers have the loudest voices because everybody else is sitting back or they've got their information and they've moved on. So it, you can't ignore them because they get louder. So um, we address them with facts and we just kept going with back with facts. And, um, you know, we produced, uh, you know, there's a concern about insurance and whether if someone contracted COVID while they were patrolling, um, you know, what would that mean for them and their livelihoods? And, you know, I mean, they're real things, um, but we had addressed that over and over again. So, you know, we then developed a new document that would that would detail that. So, you know, you, you can't ignore, you, you've got to address it and, and work with them. But at times, yeah, it was a little bit frustrating. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it, you know, there was also, there was, a, there was a different risk appetite, like there is with any scenario, there was, the people that were really risk adverse and just wanted literally to put a fence around the water and say we're done for the we're done mm. for the year um and then you know there was another group of people you know that say well you know it's like two cases who cares you know let's get back out there and race um and then there was a whole lot of people that just um they are predominantly we're here to serve and we'll do it at all costs so there was mm. a real so you had to kind of protect those people from themselves in some ways. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and for the, the risk adverse, you know, we actually we actually said, you know, this is a situation where you're going to have to make your own choices and life-saving just might not be for you this year and that's mm. okay. Um, so it's, you know, it's a real moral one where you can't, you, you shouldn't make people kind of do things that, that, that they're, they've got really risk adverse to, you know, how can we, how can we, we, we'll put the risk mitigants in, we'll give them all the information, but at the end of the day, you've got to make your own choices as well. So it was, it was a constant juggling of, of different, um, person, you know, personalities and concerns and, and, but um, at the end of the day, you know, you, you just got to keep moving and, and kind of cater as best you can. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> I, I remember. Um, I, I really resonate with what you were saying there around choice, though. I think that was one of the the. Um, I think that was one of like the leadership qualities that I really saw was that you were laying out the guidelines, the best information, but ultimately it was up to the clubs and the individuals to to choose their risk profile or to choose. Um, that felt quite um, quite empowering. I think. Um, and it's quite, a, um, quite an important leadership quality, I think, that you're actually giving the accountability and responsibility back to the people that, that, that need it to make the decisions they need to make, you know, in real time. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think that's in every day. You know, you see that in every day. Mm. At, at the end of the day, um, you know, we have to be authentic in, in what we're saying and, you know, um, give people the right information and, um, but at the end of the day, you know, you can't, can't make somebody, um, you know, meet exactly what you need. They're, they're going to have to get there a little bit on, them, on their own. Yeah, absolutely, for sure.
So the other um, the other thing I've been thinking about is, um, you know, as leaders, uh, we have to focus on the job at hand and and doing the job. And there's many jobs um, as part of Life Saving Victoria. Uh, but we also have to look after that emotional and mental health needs of the team members. Uh, what was interesting for me is you looked after the mental health of your own team, but then the broader population as well. So how did you how did you manage those demands of the job and the people side, um, including responding to all the volunteers and their needs there? Yeah, look, it was challenging um, and tiring, but um, for me on a very personal level, um, you know, it gave me purpose um, uh, during a really, you know, challenging time. So I, I feel really lucky. Um, I feel lucky I work for an organisation um, that we we continued and um, although it was extremely busy and, and taxing, um, I, I feel really lucky. Um, I feel lucky that um, as a leader I could contribute um, and, um, and that, you know, there was some purpose. Um, but managing, yeah, look... You know, I think I think we just really wanted to make sure that we had things covered and there was somewhere for people to go and that we reminded them continually. So, you know, the, the Wellbeing Mondays was was an initiative more than anything else to get people thinking about themselves and, and where they might be at and, and offering a number of topics that you may not resonate with one, but you'll resonate with another. So, you know, we did right from having teens with anxiety through to, um, you know, somebody that had, um, you know, thought about suicide through to, um, you know, working with elderly. So there, there was a real myriad of things and, and wellness and that we really wanted to put the proactive mental wellbeing um, at the forefront of everything, you know, where, we're an active organisation where, you know, our members are physically active. Um, we really wanted them to think about um, the, the mental side of things as well as they would with their physical health. Um, and, you know, I think we really saw the taxing nature of the pandemic on the leadership teams as clubs as well. Um, mm. So, you know, for a leader of a club that works full-time, um, you know, has a family and then is now leading their own organisation with, you know, our clubs range from 58 people to 5,000 people, um, you know, and that was taxing. So we looked at how we could provide specific coaching um, for them uh, and, and leadership um, support, whether, and we said, you know, that could be for, from a wellness perspective, it could be how to manage a difficult situation or setting goals for recovery. So, um, you know, I think it's it's having different things available for different people. We opened up our um, EAP to the whole of organisation um, and family, and and we drove that continually as well. So mm. trying to trying to kind of cater for everybody needs something different. So we'll just make a whole lot of things along with having um, you know everything printed on websites, Facebook reminders, and and um, it was just a constant proactive reminder. Yeah, I remember it was um, such a focus on what we can do as well, which is what you mentioned um, at the beginning as well. I remember sending out a message to our club saying, you know, we're going to do our best to make this happen, you know, let 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 the program run, let NIPAs happen. What, what I was interested in also was that um, in, in that activity was that more people stood up, actually, more people joined in to try to make things happen. Did you find that across the... Um, I mean, we recruited um, a number of volunteers that hadn't volunteered before because I was basically saying, we need you to make this happen uh, with all the rules and restrictions. So did you find that more people stood up in that regards as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there was this real opportunity for some people that, that potentially um, were not active or, mm. um, you know, didn't really have a motivation except to maybe drop the kids off at... at at, um, at Nippers every morning, go and get their coffees, um, or some of some of our um, probably quiet achievers in in the office and with the staff. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of particularly with our staff because we kind of gave uh, we gave full kind of openness to say go crazy. You know, what does this look like? 
innovate, mm. you know, what pivot. <laughs> all these, all <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what, what might it look like um, if, if we could do it? Um, and, you know, saw these people, these quiet achievers that just embraced it and ran with it and, and, um, and ran hard, you know, um, you, you know, and almost you had to kind of pull them back a bit to say, you know, just breathe and we'll, we'll keep going not to tire out. But the same in the volunteer world, you know, members that had, we had never heard of before or had never heard on a call before asking incredibly great questions, but, mm-hmm. but offering such solutions as well. Um, and, and also, even with some of those uh, naysayers on the calls as well, kind of jumping in and addressing it for us. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no better perfect world when, um, you know, and it's a sign of good culture when, um, you know, volunteers are addressing volunteers and, and kind of going, hey, buddy, come on, um, they've done a great job. So, yeah, no, I, Nat, for sure, you know, it's, it's something that we really saw is, um, I think out of challenges, you know, people stand up and, and find a, that common purpose. And um, mm. it, it was a really rally the troops kind of moment. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's interesting because Heather Jane um, here has put into the chat uh, a question around, um, can you, you're drawing strength, I think, from that rallying, rallying the troops. And um, you drew strength and focus from the core values. Could you tell us a bit more about how you drew some strength out of LSV's core values and how you might have leveraged those into, into exactly those kind of activities? Yeah, look, I, I mean, our, our core values, um, you know, I, I, I saw everything we needed during this time. So, you know, we've mm. got this positive and respectful relationships and, and particularly looking at that inter- intergenerational. Um, so, you know, underpinning everything we do, how can we connect and be be um, that? And, you know, being open, welcoming and inclusive, well, that's exactly what we had to be through that connection. Um, you know, and personal development um, through life-saving, developing healthy lifestyles, um, they were all things that are at the centre of every response we had. So, um, yeah, look... And being relevant in today and tomorrow society, again, really important that if we didn't, I mean, we, we knew if we didn't um, connect with our members and our people and community, then, um, you know, the pandemic was a real leveler. It was, it, if you didn't keep up, then we would, we knew after this, we would become irrelevant in mm. some ways. Um, mm. So it, it was a time where... <laughs> Lifesaving Victoria got an opportunity to become really relevant to its members, um, to its clubs, um, to the industry, um, or we could take a back, back step and just try and get through it. Um, we decided that we were we were gonna we were gonna give it a crack, and um, I think we called it. There were so many buzzwords in lifesaving. Um, <laughs> we did. Um, LSV 2.0 um, okay, yeah. and during this time and you know that's that's the stuff that we um, you know our people get excited about it's this ability to innovate um, and you know, people are so passionate about water safety and so passionate about our volunteers and um, you know for the staff I think it was we said we're going to make impact and we're going to make our volunteers' lives easier and we want to do life-saving. And um, mm. so pulling on all of those things and they do relate back so closely to our values. Um, you know, we, we had a strategy and we were going we to go forward with that. Um, and for the better good of everyone, we thought. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's what leadership is all about. You know, it, 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 it's everything that you're talking about there. Um, and, you know, as someone who um, experienced that leadership, you know, in watching you and watching the team and LSV, it was it was empowering for the people who were out, you know, on the beaches because <laughs> we had that really strong leadership coming through. And it was so clear, the values that you talked about. Um, it was so easy for me to say, this is what we're about because we were drawing on those values mm. as well and then to bring those through the program. So, mm. yeah, I think you can't underestimate that, um, you know, that that power for sure. Uh, so we, we're coming on to time, but um, there's Anne's popped a question in here about the take-up of coaching. So you mentioned that uh, people were, um, were 
you were offering the coaching and the mentoring and uh, she's just wondering was there any surprises or anything expected about that uh that, that the work you did there yeah look um I, I would say you know the take up wasn't wasn't huge in terms of that formal coaching um mm. but I think what we did see we saw a real take up in kind of this informal mentoring and informal conversations um what we what we saw was a real um, take up of, of, I guess, presidents or leaders leaning on each other, um, oh, yeah. which which we hadn't seen a great deal of. You know, the clubs like to, to kind of be in their own their own little realm, um, but there was this real shared um, shared responsibility, but shared, I guess, the weight of the world kind of um, thing, and and you know. We certainly saw more sharing between the leaders within the organisation. Um, you know, in terms of the take up of coaching, when they, I think the few that did take it up really um, were so thankful of of that. And you know, I think I think it's put it's planted a seed in my mind from a membership and leadership development perspective that our leaders need coaches. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, it's a big responsibility. Um, you know, we are an emergency service, saving lives, preparing youth, making great Victorians, teaching water safety. You know, we're so many things to so many people. You put on that the, you know, societal requirements of, you know, mental health is a challenge from youth right through. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, so, you know, I think we'll, we'll focus on that more and more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, there's, as you said, there's so many different dimensions to what you're what you're describing there. So um, another question came in here from Mike around emerging leaders. So interested to hear, um, you know, these these difficult times actually allow leaders to emerge. Did you notice anything uh, around that, either you know, across your team or across the the membership base? Yeah, probably, probably all of the above. Um, mm. Absolutely, you know, and a great question. And look, I'm I'm really passionate about our our developing our leaders, um, you know, particularly our youth. Um, but you know, likewise, where you saw these quiet achievements kind of pop pop up. Um, my team, uh, as you know now, are phenomenal. And you know, I think I said to you, I had, um, you know, I've got a a, a somebody that heads up our our nippers, um, one of my team, and and you know, she's um, she's somebody that really adverse to change, um, you know, I would say to her, come on, let's go and, you know, I'm 100 ideas at a time and <laughs> I'm like, come on, let's go and do this. And she's like, no, by default. Um, and, you know, I saw an absolute change in her that, and, you know, the majority of documents that drove nippers and, um, and you know, the training that went on and everything that went on, I mean, that was all her. Um, and, you know, she just stood up and, you know, now I go and say, how about we do this? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, out of, out of again, that adversity and, and being forced out of your comfort, comfort zone and, and really having to, to push, um, she, just, she just flourished. Um, and certainly, you know, right from our junior, junior, you know, our 13 to 17-year-olds, um, we've got a junior advisory committee that, um, that have been developed and, and you know, they're, 13 to 17 year old the next generation of, of of leaders in life saving and you know they had their own concerns that they wanted to kind of uh, articulate and how we might talk to youth about what's happening and um you know so we saw some great leadership in, in even at that very young years where they wanted to feel empowered to because they didn't want to miss out on life saving this year you know they're, they're just going to be able to get their bronze medallion which is yeah. the first step to being a life saver and how could they do that? And, you know, in the very early days, we kind of said, um, in the early days at the end of last season, we said, um, you know, under seven, under 18s can't patrol just because of we didn't quite know what it was and how could you manage that and you bring a whole lot of people and, and they wanted to make sure that when we got into this season that we've just finished now, that that wasn't on the board. Like those yeah. seven <laughs> were going to be able to... to um, to you know patrol so yeah absolutely we saw emerging leaders right right through um from our from our juniors to our seniors and 
and again people stepping up and and taking on different roles and and leadership being you know presenting in very different ways Mm -hmm. yeah uh, there's so much that you've offered us, um, Emma, in terms of, uh, you know, connection, not having all the answers, uh, focusing on the guiding principles, um, really um, encouraging that innovation. Is there any other key lessons that you learned um, that you'd like to share with us from a, a change process, from a from the leadership point of view or from the organisational point of view? Um, oh, look, I mean, for me, some of my key lessons um, were... And it's something I've always approached things is you've got to be authentic and, and you've got to mean mm. what you say. And, um, you know, I know it's all the, the cliches that being vulnerable is okay. Um, and, you know, I remember sitting in front of the team and saying, I don't know, I, I just don't know. And um, But, you know, lessons in um, setting setting up teams and, and being really clear what, what outcomes and principles you want was really critical. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's so many good things that came out of a really hard time. And I think, you know, let's not revert back to them, to the old ways. Let's kind of embrace and, and go with it. Um, and, I, and I think um, incentively people are good. And, um, and you know, some of the, some of the, bad or some of the you know the naysayers comes out of fear um and and I think you know you've got to break down and unpack things with people and and usually you can find an outcome so um but yeah um hopefully we're through this and and um and you know I mean the one thing I know is there'll be a new challenge next season so um I guess a great lesson is I reckon we can do anything because if we've got through this together you know we really can face anything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we think off the back of bushfires and um, the tragedies that clubs, you know, experience um, and then going through the, the pandemic, uh, having a successful season that everybody actually did, I think it's absolutely remarkable. When you think about the number of people that were involved um, at all the different levels, for sure. Well, thank you, um, Emma. It's, it's just been such a pleasure to, <laughs> you know, to listen to you. I could I could talk all day to you, but you know, not just chat, I could talk all day and chat to you, but um, uh, just I could just listen to you all day about, um, you know, your insights around leadership, insights around change, um, insights around leading people like that, that, you know, you said LSV is a people organisation and I think um, a number of organisations need to, re- you know, to remember that or they have, have remembered that now. Um, having come through the, the past year we had. So, um, look, on behalf of everyone um, at Open Door and Synergy Global, I just really want to thank you for your time. Um, everyone can show their appreciation in the chat box as well, but um, for your time, but also for the service, um, you know, that, that everyone at LSV does. Um, it's a remarkable organisation. It's been a pleasure to be involved in. Um, and it's, you know, we're in such a good um, good space having you as, as our leader as well. So thank you. Thanks, Matt. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Oh, you're so welcome. So uh, for all of those 